Hey there, I got another video for you guys today with Lily MD, the farm manager at the Urban Teaching Farm in Greensboro, North Carolina. And this video is gonna be more of a tour video and some insight into the farm there. And one thing that's really unique about this is that it's really a teaching farm and they have a lot of volunteer labor. So she really uh, highlights a lot of the things that are unique in terms of tools and strategies to deal with volunteers. If you guys are thinking about that, there might be some good tips in this one. And also a lot of the infrastructure is pretty portable and mobile uh, so that they can move because they're on leased land. So a lot of cool stuff in this one, guys. Hope you enjoy. My name is Lily MD. I'm the farm manager for the Urban Teaching uh, Farm. It's a project of Out of the Garden Project. And we did a video earlier all about this farm and that relationship with the nonprofit. And if you want to check that out and learn more, click this link right here. Um, today we're going to go walk around the farm and explore what's happening here now. So I think a, a really important part of uh, framing our farm here is thinking about from the perspective of our neighbors in Warnersville, um, which is where we are. And, uh, that's why we're here on our sidewalk because we are a real production farm serving 50 CSA members uh, in the middle of a neighborhood, in the middle of a city, next to a whole bunch of busy streets, um, and in a real community that has its own stuff going on. So uh, an essential part of how we design and how we interact with the space and what we grow is thinking about how we're viewed by our neighbors. So we have uh, four major fields that we use to grow in. They're all 75 feet long. Um, we use the same irrigation, drip tape, uh, landscape fabric in each of the fields so we make it as similar as possible so that's more efficient for us. Um, they're all just under a quarter of an acre each, uh, maybe a little bit smaller than that. And yeah, this is our north field, creatively named. Okay, this is the first one you see when you, when you pull up here. Yeah, depending on which direction you're coming from. Alright, uh, so you, I know the field blocks are kind of in different spots around the property here. Is there do you grow certain crops in certain blocks or is there a rotation there? Yeah, we rotate constantly. Um, each bed gets between two and four crops per season. Um, we try to rotate in cover crops as much as possible. Uh, we intermix silage tarps and um, sometimes we'll intercrop and, and kind of like, we haven't fully experimented with like crimping and, and planting in directly into uh, old beds, but would love to explore that more. Um, we just need the right implement. Okay, and that, yeah. that block up there that's covered in landscape fabric, that's going to be strawberries, you said? Yeah, so we, you know, as a nonprofit, we get a lot of offers for donations all the time, and sometimes the donations are too hard to pass up, even if you kick yourself immediately afterwards. And uh, <laughs> we were given um, 1,300 beautiful uh, strawberry plants. So we made space for them. And so we have this you pick section um, that's going to be like a gift for the community and the neighbors um, growing things that are really familiar and um, recognizable is pretty important for us out here so the first thing people will see is a whole bunch of strawberries which everyone knows what strawberries look like so it'd be great so we're in uh, our one tunnel that we use for our um, our starts and then uh, some things that need a little extra care uh, we don't have anything in ground in this space um, this was built as like a balance between what what do resources do we have um, what suits our needs and what ha is not going to require that much maintenance and upkeep. We, with our land lease, um, it's a really good opportunity for us to have access to this land, but everything needed to be pretty temporary. Like the, the, the thing I've been going with is if we needed to, we could disappear all of this infrastructure within a week. And so nothing is, there's no concrete poured in the ground, nothing is buried, um, things are all surface level. Uh, and so this was a really quick build um, and we've been using it. It's been really effective. We have these mobile uh, benches that you can pick up a whole bunch of trays all at once, which is great. Sawhorse on one end, and then we have these barrels filled with water for a bit of a heat sink, um, passive solar heating um, throughout the winter, which is amazing. And in pra I, like I've always read about these, and then in practice this past year, it truly they have buffered. We have 18 of them in here, um, and it has buffered like that three or four degrees 
both in the, the peak heat of the day and in the coldest part of the morning. Uh, it, it allows it to not quite get that cold or that hot. And it's made a difference to our plants, uh, big time. So this is our outdoor kitchen space. Um, when we have crews come out, whether it's uh, our, our paid summer interns or our volunteers, um, we try to cook the food that we're working on harvesting and taking care of throughout the day. Um, and so we pull out backcountry stoves and cook on this space. We, we store things tucked away in a more secure location. Um, being a, a farm in the middle of the city, we, you know, we don't want to ask things to walk off. We're just going to we'll put it away and use, bring it out when we need it. Um, but it's great. It's an awesome little covered space. It's kind of like our meeting point. Um, this was a quick volunteer group build. It was a really fun workday project and it's been super effective. So this is sort of the gathering spot. You look like you got a board there to organize that for work for the yeah, day. Yeah, this is like our, our weekly work schedule. We put it on there. Um, we also use Slack a lot. It's kind of seasonal when we have people at the farm at the same time overlapping a bunch. We'll use this board regularly and then when we get to a point where like I'm here Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Fridays, someone else is here Mondays and Thursdays, someone else is on the weekends, we use Slack and some other platforms that are more, um, that don't require us all to be here at the same time. So for cold storage, it looks like you got a refrigerator trailer with the AC and the cool bot, but you said it's not fully refrigerated? Yeah, so we, we factored in how much space we'd actually need um, with a little bit of growth potential and it wasn't the entire length of the trailer. So we used like these four inch thick uh, foam plywood sections to wall off the center of it. And it's our locked storage for our BCS tractor and a few of our other like high value items. Um, as we are an urban farm in the middle of the city, we just want to lock away the things that are most valuable to us. Um, and it's been great, it's been really effective. Does it move around at all or it's just? Yeah, it has the potential to, right? Which is the most important part. Uh, we don't currently move it anywhere because we don't need it to be moved. But as we are developing this space and thinking about potential of developing satellite farms and operations in different locations, having the ability to move it, just it, it's, it's comforting to us to know as we grow. So one of the challenges you have is that you have a lot of volunteer labor. How do you manage all the tools with that? Because like if you're having a project with a bunch of people, you need a lot of, of the same tool, right? Yeah, and there's definitely strategy involved. Um, we would love everyone to be out here like standing up and using a, a, a like a collinear hoe that's super efficient and effective for their body and safe to use, but those tools cost 60, 70, $80 a piece. Um, so finding the right balance between like a few really nice ones and then um, other, like thinking about the tasks that will actually be repeated by volunteers all the time, like mulching. And so we got like 10 really high quality uh, forks that work for our mulch pile and that we're constantly moving around all the time, um, but we're not investing, like we're not repeating uh, every tool by 10 because it's just too cost prohibitive. So if I'm a farm that's looking to get into having more volunteer labor, what are some tools that you recommend having a lot of? Yeah, this is something we think about a lot. Um, because you want everyone to be able to do a, a effective work and a work that's actually relevant for your farm and helpful for your farm. But then they also, like we had a volunteer group come out one time uh, and we didn't have the right tools and we had everyone using trowels moving mulch. And it felt really weird. <laughs> they didn't enjoy the work. Um, it was super awkward. So having the right tools can be really helpful. So I guess it really depends on the kind of work that you're asking people to do. Like if right. you're doing a lot of like, you know, material moving, you probably need a lot of like pitchforks and shovels and wheelbarrows, right? Yeah, and, and, and being, like having those go-to volunteer tasks for your volunteers, um, no matter what group it is, what size, like making sure you can accommodate, at least for us, uh, like groups of 30 are pretty common. Groups of 30 for like two hours. And what is, what's a group of 30 for two hours gonna do? They're, they're gonna move a lot of mulch for you and maybe do some weeding. So having like a set of, um, forks and shovels that are good for mulching and then having a set of weeding tools that you can put maybe 10 people on for a couple hours is really essential to using that energy effectively. So what is the most important tool for volunteers? I, I, I have a feeling I know what the answer is going to be. but Yeah, I mean it's as simple as it sounds. Um, gloves. Uh, having like good quality gloves for your volunteers to use. I mean you're inviting people out to work on your farm who aren't doing uh, manual labor on a daily basis and they're also not working in the dirt and on a farm constantly but they they, they came out to help you because they're interested um, so having like something like a good pair of gloves is so effective in getting people to work more for you and actually enjoy their experience okay so what's the strategy here just ball them up like a pair of socks and oh they go yeah in the and then when it gets chaotic that's a volunteer task <laughs> it's like organize all the gloves so we're out now near the other two fields. Can you talk a little bit about these fields, uh, maybe size and different kind of crops you guys grow? Yeah, so they're all the similar uh, bed length, 75 feet long. Um, this one has 13 beds in it. 
the Southfield 2 has 14 beds in it, 30-inch um, top, 18-inch pathways. Um, and then primarily we're growing annual vegetables and herbs. Uh, that being said, we're starting to plant in some perennials and biannuals. Um, we just got a bunch of starts from a uh, local greenhouse. Um, Parsley is going to go in shortly. We have chives in there right now. Um, we have a few perennial flowers that we're going to interplant in the rows. Uh, that will be more long term. For your CSA here, what sort of vegetables are you guys putting in those boxes? I know, you know, it always depends on your market. So, you know, is it sort of more common varieties you think that people will be eating or just some fancy stuff in there? What do you guys try to put in your boxes? Yeah, you know, we'd like to diversify. Um, we certainly have, we have between six and eight different things each week in our box. Um, but as far as like really unconventional, unique stuff, we try to minimize that to so maybe one or two um, less common things per the box uh, each week. But normally it is, I mean, this past week we had um, Mustard greens, uh, salad mix, uh, giant lettuce heads. They look so good right now. I'm so proud of them. Um, lettuce is easy, but it's great. And, uh, and we had chives and cilantro. Um, this, the end of our CSA, we've been partnering with some local food producers. Uh, we worked with someone who makes elderberry syrup. And so they are featured this week. It just, it's like a surprise part of the box. Um, so that was a part of it. And then, yeah, keep it pretty straightforward. Okay, is all, is all the produce going in those boxes produced on this farm? Yep. Okay. Yeah, all the produce comes from this space. So you guys doing bees here also? What's up with that? Yes, we started this spring and um, it's, it's kind of like our, our model out here is to find mutually beneficial partnerships. And we found someone in the community who really wanted to donate their time and their new knowledge of beekeeping. Um, we were willing to put up the cost of initially buying the hives uh, and the, the, the nukes. Um, and they've been great. They've come every single week. and. It, it, the pollination this summer was incredible. Our summer squash did so much better than other places I've worked. Uh, and I, I would just watch the bees fly around and pollinate everything. Um, and it has been an awesome teaching tool as we're like beehives, which a lot of people can be scared of or hesitant about. Um, we just have them here and they're perfectly safe and people see us being right next to them and kind of interacting responsibly with them. And it's been an awesome um, bridge maker with the community. Cool. I think that's a good example of the teaching element here and also the yeah. collaborative spirit of all the people in the community. So, Lily, thanks so much for showing me around today. Yeah, it's been a uh, pleasure. What are some ways that people can follow along with uh, this farm and other projects? So we're on Instagram, uh, Out of the Garden Project, or on Facebook, Urban Teaching Farm, and Out of the Garden Project as well. And then check out our website, outofthegardenproject.org, and uh, we'd love to stay in touch. We'll also be opening up our subscriptions for our CSA uh, if you're in the area and interested um, for 2020 in December. So just around the corner. Cool, we'll put all those links below. Thanks, yeah, Lily. Thanks. And you're comfortable with it until you maybe are a little bit. Yeah, and um, and outtakes are welcomed at the end too, so don't okay, worry about great. it. <laughs> great. All right, so we're filming. We farm together out here, two of us. Um, just keeps an eye over things. Good guy. <laughs> this is a good angle. Look of the light. Just the uh, official farmer position, all leaned up. Where are your boots? Yeah. Super hot. We like go clean up the cooler for five minutes together. It's great. And for <laughs> those of you guys who are watching that don't live in this area, you may not understand, but oh yeah, the gosh. heat in the summer is pretty impressive. Why anyone farms in North Carolina between like July and August is beyond me. I think but we lot, all do. I think a lot of us are having that discussion right now. <laughs> yeah, that's right. All right, so we're outside here. So we're outside. Oh. So maybe we'll cook during the shoot. I'm like, no, we won't. <laughs> we'll be talking.